I don't know about you all, but as I grew from a young child into a teenager and then a young adult, I found that comfort and rest became more difficult to come by. Now, ideally, all children should be able to find comfort and rest, but in our society, as we grow older, we become more and more influenced by that old Protestant work ethic. And our culture doesn't value comfort and rest as we become adults. We put a lot of pressure on our young people and on ourselves to achieve and to work and to be perfect and productive. And grown-up life is expensive. Things are set up for us to be working at least 40 hours a week for most of our lives. Even with all the washing machines and cars and electric conveniences, we still find ways to work ourselves into physical, mental, and spiritual exhaustion. I saw a graphic in the Denver Post when I was about 20 years old that showed the rest time, and I still remember it and I'm 52 now, but it showed the rest time for each species during a 24-hour period. It had a little silhouette of each species and then a bar graph showing how many hours per day they spent resting. Predators, like cheetahs, have massive bursts of energy and speed, and they hunt for a couple hours in the morning and a couple hours before dusk, but the rest of the time they're just chilling, sleeping most of the day from 9 to 5. That's actually true, 9 to 5. <laughs> On this chart, all the different species, even the grazers, are resting for most of their lives. But the humans were off the charts, busy, 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 and rarely a moment of doing nothing. So my friend Anna and I made a pact that we were going to slow down and watch squirrels. <laughs> she was my children's school teacher, so you know how much squirrel watching was going on at her house. Zero. But <laughs> We've had that pact for over a decade now, and so I asked for some chairs for our front porch on our wedding registry two years ago, and someone bought them for us, and I was all set to watch squirrels, but Jason and I have never sat in them. <laughs> One of the cushions blew away in the wind before any human being had ever <laughs> sat in it. That cushion came all the way from China, and goodness knows where it is now, probably in a bush in the neighborhood, never sat on. Now, I'm not proud of my busy, busy lifestyle. I don't think it's best for my kids or this church or even my dog and my pig who watch me carefully, waiting for the moment that I will sit down and pet them. The pig stands outside the window all day watching me. It's pressure, it's like another chore. <laughs> so, Many of us are busy people. You know who you are, and you don't tend to sit still too much, and God knows what the squirrels are up to because we aren't watching. <laughs> so today it's Mother's Day, and when I think about my 23 years of mothering, honestly, I barely remember it because it's been busy, busy, busy. All of us who identify as caregivers, whether we be mothers or fathers, parents, teachers, or nurses, or spouses who tend to the other's needs, those of us who care for our aging parents, we tend to be very busy. We're currently trying to plan a caregiver's support group for this church, but we're all too busy to make it happen. <laughs> so how can we give generously to others and yet sustain ourselves. After all, taking care of each other is a gift. Caring for people or pets or even our yard or our garden helps us to stay balanced and not get too obsessed with our own wants and desires. Caring for others in the world helps us to be whole. In America, we celebrate Mother's Day on the second Sunday of May. One of my beloved seminary professors, Reverend Stephen Jonason, wrote about the Unitarian connection to Mother's Day. He wrote, in 1872, Unitarian Julia Ward Howe began advocating the creation of a Mother's Day for Peace to be held on June 2nd each year. The following year, 18 cities held such a gathering. Bostonians con continued to observe the day for more than a decade 
While some cities continued the observance until the turn of the century, when the annual Mother's Day for Peace appears to have died out. But in 1907, Anna Jarvis, a Methodist, began a campaign to establish a permanent Mother's Day. By the following year, the YMCA had taken up the cause, and in 1914, Woodrow Wilson signed a congressional resolution establishing Mother's Day in the United States. Anna Jarvis was troubled by the commercialization of the day, saying, I wanted it to be a day of sentiment, not profit. Mother's Day is the most heavily attended in church Sunday in North American, oh, in North American churches outside of Christmas and Easter. This is the third biggest day. And in our UU churches, we strive to be more inclusive of caretakers of all identities, not just mothers. We don't often lim limit our honoring, but instead we celebrate all of those who mother or take care of others. Now for me, you, you, Mother's Day has always been a bit complicated because while I appreciate our commitment to inclusivity, there were many years when I really needed Mother's Day. For women who parent without support, our society does not acknowledge what happens behind the scenes to make sure that a household keeps running. Now, plenty of people who are not women work hard behind the scenes to support the daily life of families, and all people who care for others, both for pay or unpaid, should be seen and appreciated. But as a woman, I felt discounted and unseen when I was raising my children. I remember talking to a stay-at-home dad at a party recently, and he expressed feeling some of those same hurts from people's perception that he was less than a real man for working as the primary caregiver of his children. Even the term stay-at-home parent is outdated and not a good description of the work of a primary caregiver. And so I hope that we can be inclusive and notice and celebrate the work of all caregivers, but without the, missing the important piece of noticing what women do. Even here in our little church, I invite you to notice what women do. Men do lots of amazing things here, but still, notice what women do. Like my, most little girls, I was raised to serve others, to make people happy, to please others. And I strive to be aware of that programming and conscious of how it runs me. But still, I find myself living out unhealthy patterns of putting others' needs before my own. And sometimes, I fall into the pattern of getting a bit snarky and resentful. And you know what? I think we all do it to some degree. So Melody Beatty, who wrote our reading reflection today, is a white American woman who spent the last 30 years writing about codependency. She noticed that our mainstream culture interprets Christian teachings as a mandate to sacrifice ourselves for others. Now, self-sacrifice for others is not entirely a bad thing, of course. Mother Teresa is one of my guides because she gave her life to self serve others. But she must have loved herself enough to do her work with the poorest of the poor in a manner that sustained her own body and soul. Melody Beatty noticed that some people have, quote, interpreted their religious beliefs as a mandate to caretake. She writes, we are told to be cheerful giv givers, go the extra mile, love our neighbors, and we try. We try so hard, we try too hard, and then we wonder what's wrong with us because our religious beliefs aren't working and our lives aren't working either. Unitarian Universalists are especially prone to giving and giving until we are sometimes burned out and resentful. Just like Melody Beatty's story in our reading about her and her friend visiting the apple orchard and realizing they were both there for each other, for, to save the other one's feelings, and they didn't need apples, and there were other things they would rather be doing. People-pleasing doesn't actually serve anyone. Those of us who grew up in this culture who identify as female, we have an extra layer of challenge because just like racism, this cultural tendency and misogyny are the water we swim in. We all contribute to it. I spent years serving and pleasing and feeling a little bit ticked off about it. No, a lot ticked off. 
I didn't know how to say no. But I'm learning, and I see us all working on this here at Columbine. It's the opposite of codependency. It's the ability to set boundaries and say no. And then there is the other side of the dynamic, which is asking for help. We know that another person is busy, but it creates problems if we don't ask them to help. The culture we are working to create here is one where it's okay to ask because it's okay to say no. It is okay to say no. In fact, it's a gift. If you have the ability to take care of your physical, emotional, and spiritual needs, thank goodness the rest of us don't have to do it for you. Give us all a gift and say no when you don't want to go to the apple orchard, when you're already volunteering enough at church, when you don't want to babysit your kids or your grand, or you babysit your kids, your grandkids. <laughs> When you're tired, when you're overstimulated, when you're grouchy. Melody Beatty points out, nowhere in the Bible are we instructed to look to do something for someone and then scratch his or her eyes out. <laughs> <laughs> nowhere are we told to walk the extra mile with someone and then grab the person's cane and beat them <laughs> with it. <laughs> so please, do us all a favor and politely decline to do whatever it is other people, including me, want you to do, and you don't have the spoons for it. My husband and I call this staying on your own side of the fence, and it has been a tremendous help to our relationship for the last six years. We learned early on not to get on the other person's side of the fence. Because if you do, you're not respecting their autonomy and the mystery of their wants and needs. For example, you might say, we would really like to have Betty on the Social Justice Committee, but we know that Betty is very busy, and we don't think she'd want to come anyway. Meanwhile, Betty's over there on her side of the fence thinking, how come nobody asked me to be on the Social Justice Committee? I'm really busy, and I might have said no, but why didn't they invite me? Let's let Betty do Betty. Let's draw some sacred boundaries and stay on our own side of the fence. This side of the fence thinks Betty would be an excellent addition to the Social Justice Committee, but when we try to gauge her schedule and interests, we don't actually respect her autonomy and her inherent worth and dignity. We are each the world's leading authority on our own desires and limitations, so please don't try to guess for each other. Trusting someone to say no is respectful, and if they go to the apple orchard because they don't know how to say no, that's their problem. Let them feel the big feelings of doing something they didn't want to do until they decide to draw some lines around what they are willing to do for others. Instead, let us focus on loving and caring for our own precious psyches, our limited bodies, our emotional health and well-being. It is okay to set boundaries, and you don't have to explain why something bugs you or or stresses you out. We do best when we honor our own sacred mystery. We, you, use are the Church of the Helping Hands, and believe me, the more we reach out and help, the more we see the need. The more we are connected to each other and the world, the more we want to help. The big world, this big world and the people in it need so much help but not grumpy help, not over-extended, -exhaust exhausted, and resentful help. We strive for sustainable, life-giving help, helping, because we can't do everything. So now when I celebrate Mothering Sunday at UU Church, I'm not as desperate to be seen and acknowledged because I have learned better, not perfect, to feed my own soul with appreciation and gentleness and respect for my own limitations. You know that if I do something for you, most of the time, it's within my boundaries that I am giving with my whole heart. I'm learning to love myself, and I'm a slow learner, but I am learning to respect my own boundaries even if they don't make sense to anyone else or even me. I don't have to justify them, and neither do you. We can't solve all the problems. We can't make all the people happy. We can't serve and serve and serve without burning out. 
Melody Beatty says, after so many years of so much caring and receiving and far less in return, many professional helpers, teachers, nurses, ministers, daycare providers, adopt a hostile attitude towards their clients. They may continue to hang in there and keep helping them anyway, but they usually leave their profession feeling terribly victimized. So I grew up with this plaque on the wall in my parents' house. And the funny thing about this plaque is, and I'm not proud of this story, but 35 years ago when I moved out when I was 18, I took it. <laughs> Now, I must have felt guilty for stealing the inspirational prayer plaque from my mom <laughs> because I think I returned it at some point, and later she gave it to me. So this is not any longer a hot plaque. <laughs> but the story of the Desiderata plaque gets even better. I had it hanging in our bedroom once I lawfully regained it, and then my 19-year-old daughter moved out, and I noticed it was missing. <laughs> And sure enough, she took it when she moved out. But I couldn't really get mad at that one. I guess I deserved it. She did give it back, not under duress, and here it is. So about 100 years ago, Max Ehrman wrote the Desiderata. And this is the part of this that never stops waking me up and repositioning me in, as part of this big universe. It says, beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and stars. You have a right to be here. Yes, each of us, Max Ehrman says, each of us has a right to be here. You are the primary and really, honestly, the only steward of your own soul and your own self. And the most loving thing we can do for the people we serve is to say, to hear and know further. Be gentle with yourself and listen to your heart and your guts that will tell you where to set those boundaries. May we all be guided by our loving care for ourselves as we do the work of caring for others. And as the book of Proverbs says, above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Blessed be and may it be so.